Our guest today is Connie Gray Eyes, a leading activist of our peace region. Thank you, Connie, for coming to our program. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Welcome. So, you have been working as a leading activist of our peace region. Please tell us about your current roles. Um, my current uh, my current role in the region is I am one of the um, board members of the Fort St. John Women's Resource Center. I also am uh, one of the founding uh, members of the Fort St. John Sisters in Spirit, as well as I sit on the Spirit of the Peace Powell Committee and um, and continue to do work with families in the region of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Thank you. And please tell us a little more about the history of our First Nation communities in our region. Um, with Well, the history of, of this region, um, I'm not very completely well versed on. Um, I do know that uh, that the nations are all very unique and diverse in um, in what they offer to their communities. Um, I can speak to the missing and murdered women from the communities and how the, the communities have come together when tragedy strikes and um, that in that way they're very they're very supportive of each other and uh, are willing to to help each nation as they grieve through the processes of, of losing a loved one of their communities. And please tell us about some challenges you have faced in life. Okay, so for myself, my personal, my personal story is that uh, I was born and raised in Fort St. John. I am a, a member of the Big Stone Cree Nation, which is also in the Treaty 8 territory in which we're on. And um, I grew up in, in uh, my, my parents worked very hard. We have a large family and um, it wasn't uh, very long before I delved into alcohol and drug addiction myself. Um, I've had several instances of violence. Um, aimed towards me and that has affected my life. I have many friends that are mi currently missing or have been murdered. And I think that that has been my main um, reason and driving force into trying to make change for the women and girls of the community and to make it a safer community to live in. And uh, it's a sad topic. So sadly again, uh, what have been some challenges which have been faced by your family members? Well, you know, um, personally, one of my cousins was murdered in Edmonton, and she was beaten uh, by a complete stranger, and then he doused her with gasoline and lit her on fire. Uh, she died a couple weeks later in the hospital, and um, the the quest for justice was, was a long one. My family fortunately had um, had uh, detective that was was very vigilant on finding who did this and they did. Uh, the man was sentenced to 25 years in prison without the possibility of parole and um, so you know not only has my my auntie and my cousins had to deal with that but but all of the court systems and and the not knowing affects you greatly, the trauma that you experience on a regular basis of what happened to your child and what happened to our cousin was, um, I imagine, devastating. So uh, personally, you know, that, that has, um, has really caused me to, to try and help families in this region kind of maneuver through that process in, in a small way, you know, I, I in no way believe that, you know, I'm I'm the biggest help to, to the communities, but I do what I can because really? of the because of what my family and what I have felt with missing my friends and their cases not being solved. Um, racism plays a lot into it. You know, uh, quite often um, it's felt by families that their cases were almost uh, dismissed. You know, that there was not this huge urgent concern to find their loved ones and whether that is is um, is meant to come across um, the fact that it does is is a big issue you know uh, that I can't imagine my loved one going missing and 
having that sense that the community or or the people responsible for helping find them don't find it uh, an, an urgent issue. And again, uh, what do you think are unfortunately the causes of these problems? I think that um, that a lot of times, you know, we hear that they lived a risky lifestyle or, you know, the way that they lived their lives somehow contributes to, to the fact that Indigenous women and girls go missing or, or are murdered at a high rate in Canada. Um, I think that systematic racism and um, this attitude towards Indigenous people plays into it. You know, there's, there's no question that it's, um, it's such a stereotype that all of our people are alcoholics and we don't work and we live tax-free and all of these misconceptions about Indigenous people are there. They're, they're you know, blatantly put out there quite often. And, you know, when you get this, this attitude towards um, a group of people, then there's not a lot of concern when one of us goes missing. You know, just the other day, um, somebody posted on social media uh, a couple in the bank. Now, the lady was um, exposed, as you'd say, and they, the person that took this picture found it upon themselves to post this on social media. And my immediate thought was, I wonder if she's okay, has she been assaulted, or is she about to get assaulted? And call the police, make sure she's safe, whereas the person that posted this thought it was funny. That kind of attitude has to change when you see people that are in clear trauma and are struggling, we have the responsibility to help. Absolutely. And to step in and do what we can to make sure that they're safe and that, um, and that you know, we, we do what we can to help another person. And, you know, um, it's not the first time I've seen posts like that on, on social media. I'm sure it won't be the last. But, you know, those kinds of attitudes play into this big misconception that um, First Nations people don't play a significant role in the prosperity and the community as a whole. And uh, what do resources like land and rivers mean to you? Well, they're very important, you know. Um, it's not a... it's not unknown that I'm, I'm very against the Site C Dam, uh, the, the fact that it tramples on Indigenous rights to the land, to the, to the water, um, is of huge concern to me because it affects my life and my children, um, their ability to go out onto the land. The water is very special and sacred to, to us. You know, we need that water. and. When we go out and do ceremonies, we often take, um, we take uh, tobacco to the water and, and ask for things, you know, uh, blessings. And when you start to see development take that aspect away from, from Indigenous people and the rights to the land and the rights to go out on that land and practice our cultural and spiritual um, ceremonies you're taking away our rights and you know um, I often see people say well this band has agreed and you know it's all about the money you know when you're dealing with with nations that don't have a lot you know um, I, I completely understand why they eventually just settle you know um, and that there's no animosity towards nations that do this. You know, uh, they're doing what they believe is best for their nation. But that also doesn't mean that for other Indigenous people, it's about the money. You know, it is about, um, about protecting the future for our children. And when did you start highlighting the unfortunate 
tragedy of missing and murdered women? Um, I started this journey in about 2000, I would say 2007. I had met uh, a guy named Dave Terry a few years prior to that. He was a good friend of my siblings. Um, he worked in the Treaty 8 Tribal Association office at the time. And when I, when I started to get to know him, he worked at Ninas. And um, he come bursting into, into the Head Start and he said, you got to come to my office and see this. And I said, what? And he goes, they're doing these vigils all across Canada. And so I said, okay. So I went to his office. Um, we, we looked at what they were doing. They were doing sisters and spirit vigils, honoring the lives of missing and murdered indigenous women across Canada on October 4th. And he said, we have to do one. And I was like, okay, you know, I just thought I'll, I'll help you out. And then I never heard anything. And then a couple of weeks later, he said, our package came in from the Native Women's Association of Canada and we're gonna have a vigil. And I remember that first vigil so clearly because it was, there was only about, I think nine or 10 people there. And we had a couple of little um, preschoolers dancing for the families. Uh, there, was, there was a few family members that were there from, from different ladies that, are, that were missing at the time. And, um, and it was just so special. You know, the families there felt so uh, supported. And um, the next year we made plans and we said we're going to do another one. And unfortunately, my, my good friend passed away on National Aboriginal Day the following year. And as the date approached, I thought, I don't think that I can do this without him. You know, um, I didn't think that I could. And then I just got to the point where I realized that I needed to honor what he brought to my life and I needed to have that vigil and I needed to continue doing this because it's such an important issue to me and to the family members and it gives them an opportunity to come and speak about their loved ones. Um, it gives them the opportunity to know and feel that love and support from the community that, um, that there's people that care and so I've continued to do it since then and uh, it's taken me all the way to Ottawa and back a few times. Right. And it's such a sad uh, situation. Mm -hmm. So in the last few years, what developments they have occurred in this matter? Well, um, I think it's pretty common knowledge that they have, uh, they have started the, the first steps in having the inquiry. They've named the commissioners. Mm -hmm. um, they're mm -hmm. actively now seeking uh, employees, community liaisons where they will start to make the connections between families to speak to the inquiry about their stories and about their loved ones and about any, any valuable information they can give regarding how that case was handled, um, how they felt. And I think that, that that in itself was the main goal of the Sisters and Spirit Vigils. It was always a push to have that inquiry and always push to include families to listen to the families across Canada that were hurting. And um, so that is one of the big major, major uh, things that's happening. Uh, in Fort St. John in Northeastern BC region, um, I worked with Amnesty International to do the out of, si out of sight, out of mind um, report, which highlighted uh, resource extraction and indigenous um, rights and uh, violence towards Indigenous women and girls and um, I was quite proud of, of that project and that, that um, report that came out from it and you know I'm often asked like why why are you doing this to this region like why are you bringing this out there you know like and I and my answer is simply that I was born and raised here I love Fort St. John I can't imagine living anywhere else and it's never been about bashing Fort St. John, but it's been about trying to shed light on some issues that need to be um, that need to be put out there, and maybe finding some solutions uh, that might better the marginalized people in this community. And what support do you think the federal government is doing very well in terms of providing the support? Well, you know, um, a couple of weeks ago, the uh, federal government, they've, um, all of the provinces are creating a family information liaison unit 
that will help families of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls um, kind of navigate through the processes that they have to go through when their loved ones go missing or have been murdered. Um, things like victim services, um, how to file papers, even um, getting them registered for the inquiry. And uh, so I think that that was one of the main things besides the inquiry that the federal government is doing. Um, you know, they're creating all of these uh, filus, they call them. And um, I think that when, when they came here a couple weeks ago and spoke to families, um, you know, I think that the families gave them some very valuable information that they can use to move forward and, and make these filus successful for families that, um, that, that really need that support at such a difficult time. I can imagine how it hurts for any community member who goes missing, if it's my family member, any sound I hear, doorbell, middle of the night, I will always hope my family member comes back. Yeah. So we feel that and we always wish, hope and try to do more. And where do you think the provincial government is supporting well? I think that, um, you know, I've done a couple of, of projects with the BC's Ministers of Justice Office. We had um, a family camp where we did arts and crafts and we had circles and we sat down and had meals together. Um, you know, those kinds of things they support when we're trying to, um, to help deal with the trauma that families are going through. You know, we have counselors set in place in Fort St. John that have generously donated their time. We have uh, businesses um, that have offered, you know, things like uh, self-defense, uh, yoga, uh, Reiki, those kinds of things, you know, that, that are being supported through this community that all kind of came about when we had that camp that was supported by the BC Ministers of Justice. Um, and of course, the Filus. You know, I have, I have uh, high expectations for what the Filus are going to be able to provide to families. Um, they, they have a lot of good information that, that the families provided in, in what they found were very um, difficult things to have to go through at the time. Things like dealing with the coroner or dealing with the police, those kinds of, those kinds of things that they have to go through when your loved one is murdered or they go missing, you know, it's nice to be able to have that one spot, that one support system that you can call and say, here's what we're having difficulty with, can you help us navigate through this? And that's going to be their, their responsibility. And, um, and so, you know, I think that the BC government is, is, is pushing forward in a good way. You know, they're asking for families' input regarding these filus. And, um, and I do believe that, that they will be successful. Thank you. And it's fascinating to see several thousand people supporting you and others from all ethnic backgrounds. They come together, they feel the pain, they share the sorrow, and they try to do their best. So this mm -hmm. is what we, yeah, you know, we wish it's always like this. And uh, what do you think can be done better? Well, you know, it's really hard to to try and determine what could be done better. The loved ones need to feel like they're supported and that, that their loved one who happens to be missing or, or, or murdered has value. Um, and I don't believe that any, any of, of it is done intentionally, but if we can get to a point where, where when a loved one goes missing that that the community is on it and the community cares and um and and really shows the family that support that's about the best that we can do great and what is the cause of most of these problems is it unfortunately again economic reasons or social problems combination of these two i think it's a combination of both you know when you have when you have a marginalized people that that are continually being um, abused, uh, that are being l falling through the cracks, um, then you're going to have these kinds of issues happen. Now, one of the big things that I think that this community could support would be something like a drug and alcohol detox center 
or um, a place for people that have made that decision to quit drinking or drugs for them to go immediately because quite often and and I can say this with with knowledge that I've had many people that have made the decision to quit drinking and do drugs and um, and then sought out that help to get there and I mean it's months of waiting and when you have somebody that is just kind of oh okay I'm gonna quit and then they have to wait for three or four months to get into a facility to to get that treatment for that trauma that they've been feeling and that they've been facing sometimes that's a long time to wait you know it's unreasonable time to wait and if we can somehow come up with a solution where when somebody is is ready for that help that we have it for them then that that's a big part of, of the solution that that would help you know right now as it stands um, there's very little resources for people to go to and um, and attend treatment centers without having a lengthy wait you know you sometimes for for people that are struggling it's it's literally a matter of life and death from one day to the next you know especially with the fentanyl problem that's happening um, we can't afford to to not have those things readily available for people when they're ready and in the broader picture where do you see overall hope you know what it's that is a great question because just yesterday I was uh, given the privilege of going and speaking to a group of youth from all the nations and from, from the community of Fort St. John and to listen to them and the way they speak about the future and what their hopes are and what they want to see in their nations and what they, what they see as, um, as the problems that their nations are facing and the solutions that they have to those problems that's what gives me hope Excellent. you know when you see these young people that know that they want a better life for themselves that are um, that are willing to come up with ideas and and um, do the work to make that that a reality for themselves that gives me hope excellent and this is you know what again when we talk about the youth there are so many things and I'm also proud of the youth in the community, they have awareness, they have motivation, they want better lives. And how can education and training play a role for the youth here? Well, it's so important to have education, especially regarding the Indigenous people of this region. You know, um, we attended the DPAC that year where they, where they voted unanimously to include the residential school experiences in the curriculum. That is so important because you kind of um, give those youth, those young people, the opportunity to really clearly um, understand where Indigenous people in Canada are coming from, why there was a breakdown in our families, why there is so much drug and alcohol addiction and trauma. Um, you know, if they, can, if they could understand that, you know, my grandparents had all of their children taken from them, and my, my aunties and uncles and mother had that family connection broken so that when, you know, when we're trying to teach our children how to be parents, how do you do that when that was taken from you? So we have generations of people that are suffering from that, from that trauma and trying to heal and trying to deal with it. And, you know, um, there are many people that can deal with it in a healthy way and, and talk about it, but there's, there's twice as many people that deal with it, deal with their trauma through drugs and alcohol. So if you can give them that basic understanding of what happened in Canada and stop pretending that this nation was built on greatness instead of this nation was built on the backs of Indigenous people and taking the land and taking away their dignity our families, once you can give people that broad understanding of what really happened, then maybe that empathy when you take when you take a stroll downtown and you see somebody that's laying in the street, maybe that empathy will kick in and you can understand why that person is struggling like that. And you know, I'm, I'm really proud that the schools are including that. I've been asked to speak at the schools. 
uh, regarding missing and murdered women and girls, regarding uh, safety of women and girls in the community and steps that you can take to pr protect yourself. And, you know, I think that right now, teaching that is, is the most important thing. We need to step out of that box of, uh, of wanting to protect our kids from the truth of what really happened in Canada and, and allow them to know it, to understand it, and to feel that trauma that these families have gone through for generations. Amnesty International has given you a global award for being among eight leading women to highlight causes. Thank you for your services and how do you feel about that award? Well, the, the day that, that I realized that they had given me global recognition for my work uh, with, um, with regards to missing and murdered women and girls in Canada and my region, I was, uh, I was quite honored and humbled because um, I never really ever felt like I was this driving force or this activist. I felt like I was just being a human being and having compassion and kindness for people and, and wanting to raise awareness for my friends and my family that, that are having such a hard time. So to be, to be recognized um, internationally was, was really quite, uh, quite surprising and, and I was really quite humbled by it. Excellent. And what do you think are the strengths of our community in the bigger picture? Okay. I think the, the, the big strengths in, in this community are that when, when something tragic happens, you know, the community seems to pull together. Excellent. Um, there's so much goodness that, that comes out of Fort St. John as well. It's a very giving community. As somebody that spends my time fundraising for things like the powwow and the round dance, the community just comes together. And, and you know the the companies that that work in and around Fort St. John have always been very very uh, gracious and giving so you know that is one of the best things about about Fort St. John is that when the chips are down and they they generally come together on a side note you know um, I hope that in saying that that when more when when women and girls from the community go missing that 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 sense of community and giving is also bestowed upon the indigenous women and girls of the community when they go missing. And we're all here together as a community, mm -hmm. all continents, communities, they are beautiful in their own way. In our community, people with all ethnic backgrounds, they come together and we are all together. Yeah. Thank you for your services and Thank we you. wish you all the best. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Okay.